And I, I really started to focus more on marketing and entrepreneurship and the intersection of that. And um, there was an organization, you know, that most people have heard of called Bunker Labs. And I, they had an opportunity as a marketing director. And, and for me, it was very much like, hey, this is like a perfect fit. I hope they see that. I'm trying to make a break into marketing. I'm, I'm interested in this. I understand what they do. I understand because that's the space that I'm in. How are you doing? Reggie, I'm doing well. Veteran entrepreneurs, welcome to the Warrior Rising podcast. I'm your host, Benjamin Bunn. I've got a special guest here today. Um, just came into the organization recently. Uh, our incoming director of programs, uh, but of course does a lot of different work across the organization. We're, we're blessed to have him on the team. Um, I've really enjoyed working with him in the, uh, in the short period of time that he's been at the organization, but really looking forward to, to having him in the organization longitudinally. It's been a blast. Uh, Reggie, um, I, don't want, I don't want to rob your thunder here, uh, but of course I um, want, to, want to give you a decent introduction um, I know that you spent some time in the Marine Corps um, before transitioning out in the military since that time have been actively involved um, in the veteran entrepreneur ecosystem. And when I say that, I, it, I, I don't mean that you're weirdly out here trying to sell people crypto and shit, but you've been doing good works um, in the VSO space, specifically as it pertains um, to helping coach, mentor, and lead veteran entrepreneurs in the space. And of course, um, you, are, you are a practitioner of the gentle art jujitsu so I, we're probably going to talk about that for about 45 minutes. So yeah, let's do it. Yeah. I really want to succinctly just talk about all that other stuff for about 15 minutes yeah. and then spend a good 45 just talking about, um, adult male karate. There um, is. so I, I know, um, I introduced you, I of course want to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself, um, you know, in a way that'll probably be a little bit more explicit and better, but just as a quick reminder, if you're interested, um, in any of our programs, if you're a veteran entrepreneur who's recently transitioned or been transitioned for quite some time, um, maybe you're a military spouse, um, or maybe you're the family member of a veteran, and you're interested in starting your own business, please reach out to warriorizing.org, head to our website, sign up for our programs, and of course, if you have any questions about our programs, uh, you're more than welcome to email us at programming at warriorizing.org. We really hope you reach out. Um, we've got some fantastic opportunities um, for veteran entrepreneurs, and then of course, their family members um, so if you, if you're looking to start your own business, we're the one stop shop and we, we hope you reach out. So without further ado, Reggie, I know, like I said, I, I gave you, a, a an unintroduction of sorts, but please tell, tell us a little bit more about yourself. I'd love to hear the, the quote unquote elevator pitch. Um, and let's spend some time digging in and learning about you. Yeah, man. Well, first and foremost, it's, uh, right back at you. You know, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be working with the team. Uh, nothing but good things, man. And I'm, I'm really excited about about what the future holds. Um, long story short, man, I didn't have a lot of options. You know, whenever I was when I, whenever I was in high school, I wasn't really the best student. Um, you mix that with September 11th, and I realized that there's probably something that's beyond myself that I could be a part of. Like, I wanted to... I think in the in the heart of it all, I really I had a heart to serve, and I just didn't know what that looked like yet. So, how, how old were you when September 11th happened? Well, I was a sophomore in high school. Okay. When September 11th happened, and I remember hearing about it, and I was like, I want to do something about that. There's just yeah. something that you want to you want to do, and and I made my mind up at that point. It was like, you know, I think that this is this is something that I want to contribute to. And I, I need to serve my country. You know, I've um, I've had an opportunity to kind of um, talk to a lot of young service members. You know, people that are still on active duty. Yeah. To include some people that are, are have recently transitioned out. They're in their early twenties. Yeah. These are people that have have done a full enlistment. And there's a there's a young man that's in the Skillbridge program uh, at my gym, uh, Air Force veteran, great kid, ha has had a really exciting career, helped refuel do midair refuels and oh, stuff yeah. like that. So cool. really cool stuff, operational stuff. Yep. Um, and uh, he was not alive when September 11th happened. That's crazy. Like he, he was not physically yeah. like living, breathing. 
Yeah. And this is somebody who, who had no real context um, for what it meant to, to like see America under attack in that way. Yeah. And, and still is, is out there serving. Um, and I just think that's really interesting. So do, do you remember exactly where you were when September 11th yeah, happened? Man, I, was, I, was, I was in the hallway of Alliance High School in Alliance, Nebraska, okay. um, probably doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing. And I remember them saying, like, hey, there's something that's happening on the TV. You need to get back to the classroom and check it out. Everyone's watching it. Yeah. And it was just the events of what was happening. I think I was in a business law class at the time. You business know, law in high school. Business law in high school. God damn, you're because it wasn't. Sounds... It's because it wasn't math, and I had no problem reading and yeah. just comprehension and writing things down. But no, man, um, it was sobering, and I, I remember that, and that's what that's actually what led me on this path. I actually had the opportunity to to talk to President George W. Bush, and I approached him. This is fast forward last year, right? Yeah. And I approached him, and I, I just had to have uh, some courage. But I approached the, the former president. I said, I don't know if you know this, but September 11th completely shaped the trajectory of my entire life. And I know that that wasn't easy for you as a president of the United States to make the decisions that you had to make. Yeah. And I do believe that in things that happen that aren't the best, that sometimes we could pull good from those things. In my life, even, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan and all these things, my life has turned out for the better. And I hope that there's many more service members that could say the same. Yeah, I, um, I think about that a lot. And, you know, September 11th was like literally like last week, right? Yeah. Last, last yeah, Wednesday, a week ago was September was. 11th. And, um, and like the people closest to me, my family members, my wife, my mom, my sister, all these, all these people that have been in close proximity um, to me for, for years at this point, or, you know, or close to me, they all know that like, I, you know, I, there was a point in time when almost all military holidays would like really it would cause pause and I'd be reflective or kind of quiet that day. Um, that's kind of passed. I've been out of the military for a good amount of time. I, I don't spend so much time looking back on things so much as I do looking forward now. Uh, but veterans, veterans day and September 11th are, are still really important dates to me specifically September 11th for the exact reason you said, yeah, like the, absolutely. the entire trajectory of my life, like changed drastically, just like, just like that. I was already in uniform. I was already, I was like 19 years old. So I was already, you know, I was already old enough to, to smoke cigarettes and legally purchase pornography. Um, but you know, I was in uniform, saw it go down and I was like, I had a soft skill MOS. I had no machinations or thoughts that I would be participating in active warfare. And I remember like watching it on the television. I was like, Oh my God, dude, we're for, we're for sure going to war. Yeah. And I was like, and that's not a problem. Um, so it sounds like you're, you're near do well ac academic, right? That sounds yeah. familiar. Yeah. Um, and uh, living in like a place in Nebraska I've never heard of. Yeah, that's right. This sounds like a good recipe for somebody to enlist in the Marine oh, Corps. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Man. That's right. Tell me, what, what, what drew you to the Marine Corps? You saw that happen your sophomore year, obviously. You had some time to think about what you were going to do before you graduated. Tell me about what made you, what drew you to the Marine Corps and tell me yeah. a little bit about that experience. Yeah, man. So I have a cousin. He's more like my brother, uh, Caleb Irick. He's actually still in the Marine Corps. He's an EOD tech. Hell yeah. And um, I, I remember seeing who he was when he left. And I remember seeing who he was when he came back. Yeah. And I was literally like, whoa. He's brand new. Like, look at you. Look at you. And... I was like, I don't know what they did, but I need that. Yeah. <laughs> I need I need that in my life because that's that's really uh I, I actually want to do something with my life. C can I ask you something like kind of personal? Yeah, for sure. Let's get personal. Yeah, let's do it. Um did you did you like who you were when you were a kid before you joined the Marine Corps? Man, that's a heavy one. No, yeah. man, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. Um I didn't. Let's just be honest. Um I was and I think that's a lot of the reason why like, a lot of kids that are kind of going through the things that I was probably going through at the time. You don't like who you are. You want to do more. You got, you got people that are telling you like, you're never going to amount to anything and you're really not doing it any service for yourself. You're just proving it right. Yeah. But you're not happy with that. You want to do more. And it's just a matter of getting past the voices, getting past the, the situations that you find yourself in and just making good choices, you know, and yeah. I had a hard time making good choices. So 
there's a lot that can be said to that. And I felt like, you know what, this is probably the one choice that I could make that might correct all the bad ones I've made. Yeah. Dude, same. Like I, and I, I've talked about this before, talked about it before on this podcast. Like, mm. I, you know, I wish I could tell everybody that like I joined because I was patriotic yeah. and wanted to serve my country. This all came later. Yeah. This all came later. Um, I got it one way or another. But man, like, I, th if I'm being honest, like, the reason I joined is like the same thing that you talked about. You saw, you know, a family member, you know, who um, I assume you were close with. Yeah. And man, he came back and he was and he was brand new. And honestly, man, like, I didn't like who I was when I was younger. Same thing. I was near do well, and same thing. Teachers and and people close to me, dude. In some in some cases, my own family members were like, "Hey, man, you're not doing." It wasn't like I was a criminal, you yeah. know. Although I, I, I did come close to getting, uh, you know arrested for some pretty serious shit. Um, not like, you know, anything violent or drug related, but just criminal mischief. We can get into that some other time. But, um, I, you know, but they had told me to my face, it's like, hey, man, you're not really doing anything. And it just, it hurt. And, yeah. I, and I knew and I was like, but damn, I, I'm not doing any of the work. And I was like, you know what? These guys look like they've boxed up the work in a really nice package. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I think back in the day, you know, if, if you were a young man and, you know, you didn't come from wealth. You didn't necessarily have a, a future that looked exceptionally bright, whether because it was, you know, the, you know, how, where you were born, how you were born, you know, whatever the circumstances that surrounded your life, you could just sign up to go off to sea or to join the French foreign league or whatever, you know, That's right. and then you come back four years later and you're like, you're with a bunch of elephant tusks and now you're a man and you've got wealth and all this other stuff. And yeah. that's what I wanted, man. I wanted to go off and, and become somebody, somebody brand new. I got exactly what I bargained for, not under, not necessarily under the terms that I created, yeah. but I got exactly what I bargained for, and I bet you, I bet you, you did too. So, yeah, man. So you you saw this opportunity, you were drawn to the Marine Corps. Yep. And I mean, from there, the rest was history, man. It was off to the races, uh, you know, boot camp, MCRD, San Diego, and before I knew it, I was an infantry training battalion, and. Next thing I knew, I was I was going to my unit, uh, first light armored reconnaissance battalion, and I think it was six months later, was my first deployment to Iraq. Yeah, and I came home, uh, had a quick turnaround. I think it was like eleven months, second deployment to Iraq. Yeah, and then um, at that time I was coming up, you know, at the I think that was like getting close to the end of my first enlistment. You know, I met my wife and married. You know. Um, and got orders to North Carolina. So I was in 2nd Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion uh, for f about five years, four years, something like that. Did a Marine Expeditionary Unit with them. I got to go to uh, Spain, see the Middle East in a different way, training with different units all through the Mediterranean and in the Middle East. Um, got home from that and then recalled right back to Haiti in 2010 yep. for, their, for an earthquake. Okay. And so... That's a lot of fun, right? Like I just got home and it was literally one week later we went straight back to Haiti. Yeah. Um, but that's a that's it sounds like you had like a really formative experience, yeah, you man. know, while you were in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Um, couple deployments to Iraq. Um, it sounds like you had an opportunity to, to go with, you know, these expeditionary units. Yep. Traveling kind of the world, seeing the sites, um, all this kind of great stuff. And then of course, you know, doing, yeah. doing some other real time missions that don't necessarily have to do with active combat yep. and places like Haiti and all this kind of good stuff. Um, well, what, what year did you, what year did you start and what year did you get out? Yeah. So I joined in 2004 and I got out in 2016 and most people don't do that. Right. Like yeah. I, I served for 12 years, uh, honorably discharged. It was my decision to go. Um, that's still one. I mean, honestly, if I would have stayed in, I'd be retiring, I would have retired in August, you know, so freshly minted would have just been in for 20 years. And I've often thought about like, what if I stayed? Yeah. Only to realize like, man, I can't imagine just starting that transition process now. That, yeah. Oh my gosh. What, what a, what a crazy time to, to have been doing that. Right. Um, and same, right. I, I got out in 2016 and, and I often think about what it would be like if I were starting my transition now. And I mean, like, heck, when I, yeah. when I, um, you know, when I got out of the military, I, I opened up a CrossFit gym. Like, what what would it look like to open up a CrossFit gym now? And yep. in a post COVID area, 
in a place like Tampa, which is my hometown, which is absolutely blowing up. You know, there's yeah, there's more than like six billion dollars in active construction projects that are going to be taking to place across the next three years. It it's it it's it'd be an impossibility, and there's no way that I would have access kind of those opportunities. I think about the military. I, I I put a lot of what ifs on it. You know, yeah. What what more could I have done? You know, and I and I think I had a by all by every measurable, you know, uh, uh, or by every metric that's out there, I had a really great career in the military. Yeah, man. But I'm always like, what if? But that being said, I'm incredibly happy with the with the life that I, I have. And I think I really got a head start on on this thing that is life in the private sector. And yes. I tell people all the time, listen, brother, it's not it's not a matter of of if. It's just when. You you are gonna get out. Your military career will end at some point. Yeah, man. And, and it's like, do you want to vote in it or do you want them to decide for it? You know, so these are all part, these, that's all part of the decision making process. Yeah, yeah. And it's tough, right? It's tough for sure. And that's part of what makes transition tough. So, yeah. And with that in mind, tell me a little bit about your transition. Sounds like you said you, yeah. you got out around 2000, 2000 uh, 2016. 2016. Yeah, so, man, that was me and you got out around the same yeah, time. So tell me what your transition was yeah, like. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'd like to, you know, I want to talk about the last you know, three years of my military service, because that, that's very transformative into the decision of that transition. And, um, you know, I was a, I was a combat instructor at Advanced Infantry Training Battalion. I was sent, getting sent to a lot of schools, you know, they were sending me infantry unit leaders course, I was a course chief for the LAR Master Gunner course. And, and I was getting schooled up. And it was awesome, man. And, and so there was like a very promising future. I was about to be promoted to gunnery sergeant. I was in the below zone, I think, the year I was getting out. All that to be said, I was just kind of like becoming this sponge for knowledge. And I, I felt like, you know, I think there's more on the other side. I think there's more that I actually haven't touched yet, you know. And, and I'm kind of curious what that looks like. And that paired with kind of just where I was in my life with my family, my kids. I wanted to be home. For the last three years, I was home, you know, and I hadn't had that. You yeah. Know, I missed my my youngest daughter's birth because I was in Afghanistan. I left to Haiti, or not to Haiti, but the 22nd Mew, you know, in the, some very early years of my daughter's life, you know, and and with my, my wife as well, just those are very transformative years in parenting, you know, and, and being, a, being a family unit. Yeah. Um, so pair that with this kind of creation of like what else is out there and then just, you know, some stuff happening uh, where I felt like we just needed to be there, not just for my family, but my my extended family, my in-laws, who I'm very close with. You know, there was just things that were happening. I'm like, yeah, you know what? Family's supposed to be family. There's more out here. I think it's time to I think it's time to really think about getting out. Yeah. Um, all that to be said, I had no I had no idea what I was going to do, man. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, I knew I had this really amazing opportunity with the post 9-11 GI Bill. I didn't even join for the college benefits. Yeah. But as I was getting out, I started to think about that. And um, that was it, man. I, I said, I don't know what I want to do, but here is what I will do. I will commit myself to learning. I will commit myself to going to school. And I will not act impulsively to get into a, a career uh, yet. You know, so let me just figure out what that looks like. So I was slinging boxes at UPS. We moved to Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and it was a very humbling experience, man. I've always been on my own since I was 18 years old doing my own thing. And now I really needed support. So it was very humbling for me in a good way. Uh, going to school and being kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, challenged, man. Yeah. You know, like I was the oldest dude in a lot of the classes. Yeah. How uh, old were you when you went to school? I was about tw I'm 29, 30 years old. Let's go. You know, so... And I just committed to it every day, man. And there was things that I had to go back and study because I didn't, I just didn't have the base knowledge. I'm not afraid to admit that. Like anything with numbers, right? Like just to get to where everybody was, I was like watching YouTube on how to like break down certain formulas and do different things. And I'm so glad I did that because it was just something I was able to break through. And now I use it every day, you yeah. know, no matter what I'm doing. But um, all that to be said, yeah, I went, I went to school. I graduated with a degree in social entrepreneurship with an emphasis in economic development. And, and entrepreneurship was something that I was interested in learning from a career field 
perspective, right, at the time. And um, I had the opportunity uh, when my first position came to be, it was in 2018, I was selected to lead the initiative of launching a veteran business outreach center for a CDFI in Nashville called Pathway Lending. Okay. So um, they were one of five selected from a VBOT grant, and I had the opportunity to build that in Tennessee and Kentucky. So at that time, it was very much of an entrepreneurship thing where you're building something for someone else. And uh, I learned a lot during my time there, uh, met a lot of people, helped start a lot of businesses. And where I was, where it was really cool for me, man, was I was actually able to see behind the scenes on like what it really takes to get a business loan, you know? So, yeah. so I approached business planning from the perspective of the underwriter and I was able to communicate that down to the entrepreneur. And I think that first year we were open, there was like $1.4 million of capital access and we're talking small businesses. We're not talking, we're talking like mom and pop shops that usually have a hard time getting capital. So that was a pretty cool experience for me. Nice. So I want to, I want to unpack a couple things. Yeah, man. Um, you know, so thing number one, you, you mentioned um, that you had, so when you went to school, you mentioned that it was, it, it sounds like it was more than just like education academically it sounds like there was like a little bit of self-education that oh, was taking sure. place for sure man. it's interesting because you know i i spent a lot of time spent about 10 years enlisted um, before i went off to get my commission and you know I, I i had a i really felt that i knew who i was when i when i went to college like i you know i was a green beret i had been on multiple combat deployments at this point um i had done hard things i i felt strongly that i I knew deep down what my core values were and who I was and what I stood for. And I got to be honest with you, when I went to college outside of the education that I received in class, there was this additional education that I received that was kind of a social education. Yeah, man, for sure. And the ground was kind of shifting underneath me at that point in time. You know, you know the American people 100% supported soldiers and service members and the sacrifices that we were making and would continue to make in support of the global war on terror. But there wasn't a ton of support for the war, and people were scrutinizing the government more and more and more. Um, and I remember the the year I graduated, Os Osama bin Laden had been killed. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, damn, dude, why are we still at war in Afghanistan? Isn't that why we went in the first place? And, yeah. and I, I started to question things a lot yeah, more. Yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, I, I, I went on to get my commission and then, and then finish my service as an infantry officer. But, it you know, that... That changed me a lot. And I remember, you know, I, I felt relatively, I, I guess a good way to, to describe it is I felt like I was a pretty conservative individual. Yeah. But I, I walked out of college with just like a different perspective. For sure. And I, I questioned a lot more stuff. And, oh, yeah. and I was a little bit more introspective. And I was a little bit more willing to, I was more willing to ask more questions. I was like, I wonder why we're doing this, right? Yeah, for sure. And I did it not because, you know, I was a usurper or anything crazy like that, but more so because, you know, listen, I, I college instilled in me a curious nature. And I was also really involved um, on campus. And that involvement, you know, gave me a, a broader feeling of, of community and being involved. And it sounds like that, that happened with you too. But yeah. specifically, it sounds like you got really invested um, and working in entrepreneurial efforts. And of course, yeah. um, I'm sure you were drawn um, to uh, uh, essentially veteran entrepreneurial efforts. Yeah. So great stuff about you know, working with that organization. It, looks, it sounds like you were helping and focusing on, uh, on lending and lending opportunities, this kind of stuff, which is great because that's probably the number one question we get yep, from our sure. veteran entrepreneurs is how do I get money? For sure. Um, I tell people all the time, mostly it's from friends, family, and fools. And then mm -hmm. after that, um, commercial lending, or if you're just shit hot, you can, you can start barking up the tree as some uh, venture capital group that's going to ask you for 10% of all your shit and then, and then also want to vote in everything that you do and is going to scrutinize the hell out of you. We can talk about that agnosium. I'm sure we will. Um, but uh, tell, tell me about, um, you know, it, so it sounds like your collegiate experience set you up really well for what you would be doing professionally um, over the next few years and for sure what you're doing professionally now. So yeah. tell me, where, where did that take you? Where did you find yourself? 
I, I know I know personally that you doubled down on working in the, in the veteran entrepreneurial space. Yeah, for sure. And when I say that, I, I you know you're not just like weirdly at a networking event, you know, spinning a lanyard around your finger and trying to sell everybody crypto or some weird shit like that. Like <laughs> you were substantively involved yeah. with you know uh, uh, veteran service organizations and veteran entrepreneurs, yeah. essentially you know, helping these individuals transition yeah. and find additional tools by which to be successful. So I'd love to hear about where that took you professionally um, and kind of what you, what you found good, bad, or indifferent in the space and just hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure, man. So um, I stayed with that organization for almost five years, you know, and um, at the time I was going back to school at the time I got my MBA and I, I really started to focus more on marketing and entrepreneurship and the intersection of that. And um, there was an organization, you know, that most people have heard of called Bunker Labs. And I they had an opportunity as a marketing director. And, and for me, it was very much like, hey, this is like a perfect fit. I hope they see that. I'm trying to make a break into marketing. I'm, I'm interested in this. I understand what they do. I understand because that's the space that I'm in. So maybe this is an opportunity for me to like break into marketing. That was actually, that was actually the goal uh, was to break into marketing. And, um, and I wanted to do it not just for a big organization. I wanted to do it were my intersection of like what I was passionate about and what I felt like I could really help people with, you know, and, and before I knew it, I think it was like a, it was like four interviews and I ended up getting the position and stayed with them for, um, for a while, you know, and we were, we were focused on helping build a community. You know, I think that was the number one thing was building a community of, of entrepreneurs that kind of chewed the same dirt and understand the struggles of not only entrepreneurship, but also the things that we deal with every single day, you know, and I mean, those are things that usually you feel a little bit more comfortable when you've broken bread with somebody that kind of has a little bit of the same lived experience, you yeah. know, and it just makes life a little bit easier. So we, we really doubled down on that because that was kind of what we were known for. Um, and so I, I did my part on that just to help make sure that we communicated that message clearly. There was an amazing team that I worked with um, that that made that happen. I can't take any of the credit for that, you know, and, and it was good, man. Um, that eventually led to the acquisition of, of Bunker Labs and of the IVMF, another respected uh, organization at the end of 2023. That was the strategic direction that we were going, you know, and it, it made sense uh, for that to happen. And um, all that to be said, the focus never changed, you know, like the focus was always how do we help veterans and their families start and grow businesses. That's right. That's, that's it. That's yeah. all it was. And like, so the focus was always there. And, and the focus, what I learned in my time there, and I think I could, I'm trying to be like succinct in the way I answer, but there's just so much context, right? Like, I used to be really focused on the technical assistance with, with Pathway and the VBOC. And then I realized there's just so much more to the equation. Like there's times I've picked up the phone and just called somebody because you got to do that, man. Because like, like, hey, man, are you good? Yeah. You know, and talk to me. Like, what do you got going on? How do we help more entrepreneurs get access to capital in different ways? Like, let's do a pitch competition. Let's do these things. It's like just being, under, being understanding and knowing what the challenges are. And, and being a person that could be a, an advocate to be a, a viable solution to what that is, right? Yeah, yeah. And you said something important, and I kind of want to take a minute to kind of like give a, a, a shout out to some of, some of the other adjacent organizations that are in this space doing the same kind of good works that we're doing. Um, you know, the veteran, veteran space is interesting. You know, you've got organizations like the VFW and American Legion look really similar. You know yep. what I'm saying? Yep. Um, you know, it's a, it's a way for, you know, veterans in their local communities to continue to connect with one another and like wear goofy hats. That's kind of like what the VFW and the American Legion can do also provide excellent means and services and tools for, for, sure. for veterans specifically around disability and veteran issues, this kind of thing. Um, and there's been great organizations out there that have helped wounded warriors and gold star families, this kind of thing. But you know, you know, the global war on terror is over. Yeah. It's over. And we're kind of a nation, I don't want to say a nation at peace, 
there's always something happening abroad that involves our, you know, that involves U.S. foreign policy, economic policy that, you know, ends in kinetic conflict. You know, obviously we've we've got serious conflicts um, with our allies. You know, both, um, you know, in in Asia slash you know uh, Eastern Europe, and then of course, in Southwest Asia. Um, and, you know, Israel and, and Palestine, obviously, but like for us, you know, there's, there's no real, there's troops abroad in support of, of, you know, those efforts and other efforts, but for the most part, we're at peace. There's not, we're not getting notifications on the news about how many people died today, you know, which was, yeah. which was happening when we were in Iraq and Afghanistan, and particularly sure. at the height of those conflicts. So there's been a big shift in like what veteran service organizations are providing. And um, I love organizations like Team RWB, you know, that are focusing on health and wellness. I think it's like a, a really simple yet artful solution um, to some of the problems that are that are really plaguing, um, uh, you know, the veteran community right now. Yeah. Um, I, dude, I just signed up um, to become an Eagle leader. I know you're, you're kind of, you have yeah. machinations to do the same. Nashville and Tampa obviously are like great places to seek out solutions that revolve around health and wellness because there's just a ton of stuff to do um but specifically you know veteran service organizations that, that focus on veteran entrepreneurship this podcast is here to educate veterans on how to become better entrepreneurs we're not the only resource out there i love this organization i've been here for for just over three years i love what we're doing um, i'm very passionate about it and this this is a lot of fun for me yeah i, I like it i didn't have a lot of assets and tools when I was starting my own business, and I felt very lost and I felt very much less than and not qualified. You know, I got a degree in liberal arts. So, you know, I, I didn't have like a really sophisticated way by which to approach starting my own business. I had some, some great coaches and great mentors, but I was like, I had to quilt that together on my own. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, damn, if only there was an organization that was dedicated to this. So, yeah. you know, to that effect, Warrior Rising isn't the only kid on this block. It's the one that I like hanging out with the most. Um, but Bunker Labs has done great work um, recently. You know, they've, they've partnered or been acquired by IVMF, also have, have been great evangelists specifically um, for veteran entrepreneurs, but of course other uh, veteran veteran initiatives and helping other veteran service organizations. PenFed, um, Pentagon Federal, right? Their, their foundation um, is another organization. The PenFed Accelerator Program has really sophisticated um, business owners. Like uh, uh, the majority of the people that go through their programs are ready for for venture capital investment um so we're not the only kids on the block um you know and uh, a lot of our veterans go between organizations so if if you're a veteran you're watching this i love warrior rising obviously i want you to come to us for help uh, but just understand there's a ton of we're not the only ones out there there's a ton of resources and if it was me and i was you i'd be knocking on every i'd knock on every single goddamn door like what are we doing here you know what i'm saying i tell people your your success you know, they, they, there's that old saying that you know, uh, luck is when is when opportunity and, and hard work intersect. You know what I mean? Listen, do the hard work and knock on everybody's door. For sure. I don't care where you're going to get education or where you're getting help. I don't care if you're you're doing something with Bunker Labs and IVMF tomorrow, and you're doing something with Warrior Rising today. Yep. I don't care. I yep. don't care. Um, I want to I want to cast the broadest net and ca and catch the most fish. Right. And right. this. This um, instance, you know, fish being our, our veteran entrepreneurs to try and help as many people as we can, and I, and I think we are. So, um, so it sounds like you had formative experience. I love the fact that you started in marketing. What a what a difficult, yeah, what a difficult vertical or committee. It's it's For changing sure. all the time. Technology impacts it. Yeah, you, you know, I've worked with a lot of marketing, you know, guys and gals. Some of which I, I was convinced were selling snake oil. You know, they're yeah. like, like I think CMOs are going to be a thing of the past for the oh, most yeah. part. It's usually the number one. It's usually the number <laughs> one seat that will get cut. Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, like anytime I would meet a CMO, they were like weirdly had oh, yeah. a had a brand bible that they like held close to their chest, and they would swear up and down that you couldn't talk. They were the only person that could talk about the brand. Yep. Um, and and all this kind of stuff, and they're you know. But um, but I think there there's also people that are great at marketing, um, and the ones that are fantastic have touched other verticals, other committees, yep. um, talk well across the organization, and are the ones that are you know like to inform themselves with data, and you know like to like to move to the organization in a way, um, organization whether it's a for profit, non profit, whatever the case may be, um, in a way that's going to impact the bottom line, that's whatever right. that may be. 
um, whether it's it's charitable charitable monies gained, units sold, whatever the case may be. Yep. And it sounds like you you touched a little bit on everything, right? Yeah, but it, but it sounds like you you really drilled marketing. You got into the technical aspects of lending, yep. which is a significant pain point for veterans. It's really a significant pain point for everybody, dude. Jerome Powell just just now, you know, dropped dropped you know interest yeah. rates like yesterday. So I mean, lending is is tricky and painful and difficult for everybody. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, you had an opportunity to to take this kind of broad. And I and I in in working with you, I'm struck that you're very much a, a thirty thousand foot view guy. Mm -hmm. You take a strategic approach to how you're doing these things. But it's also um, been a, a real pleasure working with you too, because when people have direct or specific questions, you're also able to get very granular. Um, so I'd love to hear just kind of like yeah. about, you know, how how you're leveraging your experience um, now, yeah. you know, in the position that you're at now, where you see yourself um, operating inside the veteran entrepreneurial space and and kind of what are the what are the big things you're looking to do now to create the biggest impact with veteran entrepreneurs that are seeking help in this space? Yeah, man, that's a great question. Let me see if I can answer it with the utmost ability because there's a lot that I want to say. I think one for anyone listening that's that's interested in their own fields or like uh, that or you're a founder and you're listening to this right now. There, the the advice that I would give uh, before I answer this is like you do have to touch things not just one thing. I believe that, like in my instance, I understood marketing, yep. I understood programs, yes, and I understood um, a little bit of strategy. Yeah, talk that shit, know? let's go. And it was like, you cannot, you cannot work in a silo. Like your left hand always has to know what the right hand is doing, or it's just not gonna work. And so if you're a founder listening to this, like you have to leverage your team. Like you have to leverage your team. You hire people for a reason, you know, it's, you hire people smarter than you, you know, it's not, you don't hire people to, to show them how smart you are. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, um, and that takes, that takes a lot of things. You have to have a culture, you have to have, you have to have skill sets, you have to have leadership, you have to like be able to, de to demystify the complexities and simplicity, you know, just make it simple, make it clear. If you don't understand what you're doing, definitely nobody else is understanding what you're doing. And if you make it difficult for your team, I can guarantee you're making it difficult for those you serve to. It's just that simple, man. Um, I, I love that you said that. I love that you said that you have to hire people that are smarter than you. I'm, I consider myself to be a, a pretty competitive guy. Yeah, man. And, um, and I do like I'm guilty of reading my own press. You know, yeah. a lot of times I walk into the room and I'm like, I'm like, man, I've got a curated mustache. Check out how tall I am. Like, dude, I weigh 230. I weigh 235 pounds, actually. <laughs> um, and I'm like, look, dude, I'm I was like, I'm the king of this castle. Right. And then yeah. but, you know, recently, particularly in this organization, Warrior Rising, we've, we've brought on some serious talent. And there have been there have been individuals that are filling the role that I used to be in. And I'm watching them do it probably 10 times better than I ever did it or ever could do it. Yeah. And I'm like, damn. I'm like, they, and I kind of like hold my hands up in the air. I'm like, damn it, there's not, I have nothing to add to this, nothing to say. Yep. And then I was like, wait a minute, that's, that's why we got this person. That's, yeah, right. that's why we got this person. Yeah. I have to remind myself that like, you know, if, if, listen, if what I need is a pat on the back, if what you need as a founder is a pat on the back, pat yourself on the back for hiring the right goddamn person. That's right. Um, holy shit. It's the best thing that you can do as a leader, or as a founder. Um, I'm so glad you called that out, yeah, right? Because a lot of times founders, founders can get in their own way. Yeah. Um, so thanks for saying that. So yeah, yeah sorry. I just, I had to riff on that yeah, quick, no, but yeah. Cool. So continue. Where, where do you, where do you yeah. see yourself and where do you see the space growing? Where do for you sure. see them the most, uh, where do you see the most opportunity yeah. moving forward? I mean, I'll talk about where rising, right? So with all this stuff about what I just said about like being a founder and touching all these different things and teams and doing all these different things. Like I look at the team and I look at the opportunities that we have. I look at the, the space and it's like, look, we are not, we are not what bunker labs was. We are not what IVMF is. We are not team RWB. We are not, uh, you name it. We're not them. Yeah. How, how do we, leverage this team skill sets our understanding of what we bring to the table 
to just completely like pour out ourselves uh, for the greater good, which is the veteran entrepreneur or the military spouse or the family member, right? Yeah. So we got to look across the landscape and find the gap. What is it right now that everybody else is not doing that we can do well? And I believe that there's some really amazing things since I've been a part of the team where I, I'm like, yep, we're going to double down on those things. Yeah. Like, for example, the pitch competitions, like we're here in Detroit right now. I even asked Jay Long, founder, co-founder of Parlay, like, hey, do you know of any organizations right now that are doing any type of uh, opportunities for pitches for folks that are not SaaS and tech and Silicon Valley type organizations? That's right. And he's like, no, I, I don't. Yeah. I mean, it's literally you guys and it's maybe the Rice business competition. That's right. And, and I'm like, we need to double down on that. Yeah. And you know what's cool about it is like people can replicate it, you know, and if they replicate it and if there's more money out there for more entrepreneurs, then we did a good thing. Yeah. Listen, you did a good thing. The more the more the merrier. Like I am a firm believer, particularly in, in the VSO space, there's no competition here. Mm -hmm. There's no competition here. We, on average, have more than 100 people sign up for our programs per week. Yep. We don't have the bandwidth to handle it all on our own. Right there, there's there's plenty to go around here, but to your point, yeah, I, I think we've we've got something special, and I love these SaaS platforms, and I love these people that have ideas that can 10, 15, 20x. Yeah. But I also think there's a spot for somebody who's just like, hey, man, I have this fantastic consumer good. It's a dairy free chocolate. It's uh, you know, a tool that's going to help children sleep better at night. That's like, right. there's a there's a place for those, and I love I love consumer goods. It's where yeah. I cut my teeth yeah. in the startup industry. It's how I really started to learn about business. And it's it's how I traditionally learned about mar everything there is, you know, when I, you know, first kind of branched out into startup industries, specifically into consumer goods, that's where I learned. That's where I really learned about entrepreneurship. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, and, I, and I love that space. And I love that we give people an opportunity to, to grow businesses like that uh, in our ecosystem. Yeah. And what's cool, I mean, all of it's cool. You know, um, I see, I see a real need for community, right? Like everybody wants, they need, they need community. And there's some things that, that I believe that we'll do that I'm very excited about, you know, for Warrior Rising in the future, uh, coming soon teaser. Yeah. But it, I, I believe that we're going to really make a dent for, for veteran entrepreneurship, military spouses and family members with some different initiatives that we have uh, in the arsenal. Uh, with that being said, too, um, I'm I'm big on community. I'm big on programs. I'm big on learning. But it's like, look, every, I could, I could point you to someone that's well more versed in accounting than I am, right? And how to do your books. What I can't do is find someone at the ready, you know, to be able to talk about the things that you may have experienced. Like we were talking about college, dude. You know, and you talked about how that was a very transformative experience for me, like with some self learning. Yeah, dude, there were days I woke up, you know, and put on my little backpack and got to eat a really great breakfast that I wasn't used to, you know, like, this is great. This is good food. This is a beautiful campus. Everything's cut so pristine. Yeah. The landscaping's beautiful. And straight up thinking to myself, like, I do not deserve this. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't deserve this. Like, every morning, it's like, I do not deserve this. And that was a really heavy part of, like, transition. You know, like, I don't deserve this. And I don't, I don't remember why. You know, I just remember waking up. And it was almost like I didn't know what to do, like, with that peace. It, like, didn't, it just didn't feel normal. And so with that, with that community, like, surrounding yourself with people that kind of get it, you know, that kind of understand the path that you're on, but also not letting that be a crutch, like not being afraid to get out of your comfort zone and go network with someone you've never, never met, has no, none of the same experience that you got. Like you got to find that balance. Yeah. It's a lot easier to do it whenever you got some homies. <laughs> yeah. No joke. So, right. So, um, people that you could really talk shop with that get it, that have been on that same trajectory that are going to the same place. There's nothing more powerful than that. So I, I hope that we can provide that in a way that's meaningful and beneficial to the Warrior Rising community. Listen, I, I think we're gonna. And um, you know, having having you come to the staff has been fantastic. Um, I love working with you. Um, 
and I, I'm really excited for the level of experience and, and passion uh, that you're bringing to the team. Listen, we're, we're lucky to have you, Reggie, and I, I mean that. Um, so you talked a lot about community. Um, talk, you, it sounds like you talked a little bit about how college was kind of filling your cup a little bit. Oh, yeah. You know? Um, maybe you didn't feel like you deserved it or yeah. you were worthy of it at first. Yep. Um, I never had that problem. I was like, I belong here. This is the <laughs> shit. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was like, I need this, man. I need a break. Uh, but uh, talk to me a little bit. I mean, we've talked all about this great professional stuff you, you've done. Storied career in the Marine Corps. You go out, you get this fantastic education, seek out a master's. You're really stacking your deck with both the, the training, education, and credentials and are giving back so much to the veteran community. Listen, what's what's Reggie doing for himself? What's yeah, Reggie, man. what are you doing for yourself? What do you... What do you enjoy personally? I'd like to hear a little bit um, about your personal hobbies and, and how you're making um, an impact locally where you live, man. Yeah, man. Um, well, big jujitsu enthusiast. So talk that yeah, shit. I want to hear more about jujitsu. Yeah, let's talk about jujitsu. So, um, you know me, like I, I, I start to get obsessed with something, and I'm like, how could we? How could I make this a business? And like, how can we figure this out? Or like, what can I do? But no, man, I. I I started training jiu-jitsu when I was still in the Marine Corps. And the only reason I did at the time, I was a Marine Corps martial arts instructor. Yeah. I was a black belt in the Marine Corps martial arts program. Got like my, that's like the MCAT program? Yeah. Have McMahon, you seen, McMahon. okay, so pause. Yeah. Have, yeah. You, have you watched Rebel Ridge yet on no. Netflix? No, I haven't. God, it's fantastic. Okay. All right, so it's about it's about a, a, a man of color who goes into a small town. Yeah. Is accosted by the police and, you know, gets in a multi-day altercation with law enforcement and the way that he, he chooses to wage war with them is because he was like an, an MCAP like instructor at the Marine Corps. Okay. And he beats everybody up with jujitsu and shit. <laughs> it's amazing. Obviously, it's a riff on Rambo. It's like yeah. a modern day Rambo, yeah. like, you know, kind of a loner. Yep. It's like carrying ten thousand dollars worth of cash on him for no goddamn reason. Um, but it's fantastic and it's it's the first it's the first movie where I've seen the practical impl uh, implementation of jujitsu yeah. as a form of combat, which like isn't always super exciting. It's like yeah, no. there's nothing, you know. It, it, it's it's like to be to be clear, like if I'm watching a movie and a guy just like <laughs> does an immunari roll on a guy and breaks his knee, and then like the, and the guy's just like weirdly can't get up. That's not super exciting. I really. It's like I told you to stay down. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I told you I didn't want to do this. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to somersault into your knee. And uh, now you need to see an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. Um, but like, really, that's that's that is a great way to end a fight. Um, <laughs> but not doesn't make for doesn't make for good showbiz. Yeah, pretty cool movie though. But so all right, so um, so it sounds like you got some weird belt in the Marine Corps yep. that probably doesn't mean shit in a yep. Gracie gym that's or right. Gracie school. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. so tell me, what was yeah. it like when you started practicing jujitsu out in the private sector? Well, yeah, man. So like, the reason I got into it was because I was like, look, if I'm gonna be an instructor for this, like, I'm tired of getting like out grappled by these d1 wrestlers like God. Oh, obviously you're going to yeah even if you're doing jujitsu you start them they're, they're doing these shot blocks it's and like they're... i'm supposed to like be teaching you how to do this yeah you know, like, so i got involved uh in jujitsu uh, at that time you know i was like a solid i don't know 185 190 not a lot of body fat laying way good shape yeah you know, great cardio good cardio good cardio man. looking good you're Real lean good cardio yeah lean and i go in there and get wrecked dude by dude like 125 pounds and he it's like he didn't even try yeah you know and instead of instead of being like insulted i was like oh this stuff works this yeah. is awesome it does i need to check this out it does and so i was off to the races it was super addictive um so off to the races for that when i got out of the marine corps i found i found a gym like real close to me and trained you know all the time the academy Shout out to the Academy, Goodlettsville, Tennessee, Jason Matherly Jiu-Jitsu. Um, but it was, dude, it was like exactly what I needed at the time, right? Like, yeah. So I had a place to go to be uh, challenged physically and mentally and doing it with a group of people. You know, that was like the best thing that I could have ever asked for, like during my military transition. Yeah. You know, so... Did some competitions, meddled at some competitions, um, and life has happened, ups and downs, where I've had to take pauses, I've had to come back in, you know, injuries, different things, but no, I've been training, uh, and 
currently a purple belt, four stripes. You're a four stripe purple belt? Yeah, man. Hell yeah, so, dude, you're right there, shit. So it's getting close, you know, I, I don't think, I try not to think about it, man. I just try to keep learning and keep growing. I got some great training partners. Um, but no, man, like there was, for the community specifically, there was an opportunity, it was like 2018, man, 2019. Um, Jason, my, the guy that owns the gym, the guy that I'm under, awesome dude. I saw him and he was like always giving breaks to people that couldn't afford it because he's a good dude. Yeah. You know you, what I mean? You, you see a lot of that in yeah. the combat sports community. Yeah. And um, I was like, there's probably a way to, there's probably a way that I could start something to help not only gym owners, but maybe, maybe people that need help. Yeah. You know, and so from that, um, Embrace Process was born. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And what we do is we eliminate financial barriers for for youth yeah. that need um, need role models outside of the home. That's the best way I know to say it. Yeah. So um, sometimes mom and dad, or sometimes just mom, or sometimes just dad, they need support outside of the home. You know, it takes a village sometimes. Yeah. And it's like, man, I've never met somebody. Well, I take that back. There's some weird people in jujitsu. But there are. The there's most, a bunch of weirdos yeah, in jujitsu. But for the most part, you know, like I'm comfortable with kids. You know, if if we can find role models for them to like help them with their everyday challenges or just feel like they're a part of something, you know, that's and I, I knew I know that because I needed it when I was a kid. God, Reggie, we, we both needed it. Right. Yep. Listen, we we figured it out. Right. Like yep. we were like, I think we talked about this, like neither of us were super comfortable with who we were or yep. what our path looked like. Yep. I knew what right looked like. I had seen men to the left and right of me, guys my own age. Yeah. That I was jealous of. I wanted what they had. I wanted to be born the way they were born. Yeah. God damn it. You know, they had I I had been to the sleepovers. I was like, yeah. damn it. I was like, this is different. And yeah, for sure. but I also knew that I was like, I didn't do the work, you know? Yeah. And I put myself in a position to go to go get that work. And I, I put it in and I, I rose to the occasion. But providing opportunities um, for, for young men who, who need coaching, mentorship, and to give the gift of, of combat sports to somebody. Listen, man, if you start combat sports is, as a young man, yeah. a military-aged fighting male, 15 years old or something like that, and you learn how to defend yourself, learn how to defend others, that is a gift. That is an absolute gift. If you can, if you can walk uh, – listen, and I, I don't want it to make it sound like I'm walking into rooms sizing everybody up. But if as a, a grown ass man, you walk into a room and you're like, I could beat the shit out of everybody here. Yeah. That's a gift. And I'm going to tell you the person that can doesn't the person that can doesn't. Right. And to, to, to have um, a background in combat sports, but more importantly, to have the coaching and mentorship from the coaches that exist inside that space that have been constantly humbled. Yeah. I got a good friend of mine um, who, who just started and he's about our age, just started. He's a white belt and he's like, dude, I'm getting crushed, crushed all the time as a white belt, I'm like, spoiler alert, that never stops. It, <laughs> it never stops. It and weirdly enough, as you're getting good with your friends, you're just like, dude, I'm always getting crushed because everybody's getting good at the same time. Yep. And so you're just like, it's it's strange. You just, you feel sometimes like you're never getting better um, until some, some, some wild man, you know, white belt with his hair on fire is flailing all over you. And yep. you kind of feel like you're, you're just like, you feel like you're diving into a weed whacker. Yeah. You're like, this is going to hurt, but I'm going to shut the weed whacker off yeah. at some point. But this, the, I'm, I'm going to get thrashed in the process. But, uh, so yeah, it's not too dissimilar from you. I, you obviously got a head start. You, you started, you know, you were obviously doing MCAP stuff and, and learning combatives, um, to teach Marines how to be better killers. Awesome. Um, the Marine Corps has always had a, a real good grip on their combatives program. I feel like I feel like they they do that better. Uniforms um, better. <laughs> their 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 martial arts program better. Their marksmanship programs better. Um, just you know behaviorally, basic God damn. training better. Yeah, uh, um, everything's just better. Giving the homies kisses better. Um, <laughs> guys, guys are just better at that. Uh, you're better at it. So. Uh, but yeah, similarly, you know, I, you know, I dabbled in martial arts um, throughout my military career. It was almost like required when you're like in the special forces. They're like, "What? You're not, you're not shooting and learning how to fight on your own." I'm like, "God damn!" I'm like, "All right, just another, another expensive um, and and grueling and time consuming hobby to pick up, right?" 
Uh, so, but had dabbled, never really took it seriously though. Never did it consistently, but I got, when I started getting my son involved in sports around the time he was four, I got him involved in jujitsu and it seemed kind of weird to have my, you know, to, to ask my child, you know, to weirdly go toe to toe with, with people about the same age and size of him. And then for me not to be doing the same. So I, I picked up martial arts again, got back into jujitsu and have been at it for about two years and I'm having a blast. Um, I've competed locally, um, you know, same thing. I have like my peaks and valleys, right? Yeah, like, a, you know, sometimes I'm traveling and I, you know, it's, it's hard to get back into, you know, I, I'll say this, anytime I'm off the mats for a prolonged period of time and I have to get back on the mats, yo, it feels just as hard as when I just oh, started. For sure, dude. I'm just like, I'm getting ready to get it takes smashed. That much, yeah, it's like, yeah. I hate to use the word anxiety, but there's like some real stress when it's you're real. back for the first time. Brother, you're time. you're fighting people. You're getting yeah. in you're getting in a goddamn fight. And you're usually like, man, and there's usually like some demoralizing things that come from that. Because yeah. the folks that haven't stopped training that you were quote unquote smashing yeah you are no longer smashing yeah and they're like is everything okay you're moving a little funny today <laughs> i'm like okay well you know that's what you've said to me is disrespectful um and belittling uh, but you know i've been off the mats for a while and i'm 42 okay <laughs> yeah. so you're 26 years old um so get off of me um but yeah like you 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 have to get onto those mat and, and there's a lot of humility in that knowing walking Walking into a situation where you are undoubtedly going to fail, and not only are you going to fail, it will be at the hands of another person. Yeah, another another person is is going, and as a matter of fact, you'll fail so badly that you will you will have to, of your own admission, ask for it to stop. Yeah. And if you don't, you'll be injured or rendered fucking unconscious. That's accurate. Excuse That's accurate. my language. You That's know? accurate. Yeah, um, and then the and in the process, you're going to be very tired. Yeah. Um, it's, it's bananas, right? So, uh, and I, I've been waiting, I've been waiting 11 episodes to talk about jujitsu. Yeah, um, and we we've, we've finally gotten the opportunity. I'm glad to have another jujitsu pr uh, practitioner in the mix. I know Alyssa Michelle also does jujitsu. Um, so we'll all have an opportunity to talk about adult karate, uh, I'm sure in the coming days. Um, so listen at, you know, towards the end of each podcast, particularly when we have great coaches, great mentors, people that have a significant amount of experience in the space. I always like to close things out with a couple great questions um, that, that can help essentially put some of these other veteran entrepreneurs that are looking for great advice, good coaching, good mentorship, and not, might not have direct access to us all the time. What is, uh, are, are there any books um, or podcasts that you're, you're reading, great resources um, that you, you found previously that you would recommend to the people tuning into this podcast? For sure. Um, big fan of copywriting, you know, like I'm a guy that, so you asked about hobbies. Unfortunately, sometimes my personal hobbies are also my professional hobbies. So I'm a student of copywriting. So the yeah. book, there's a great book, uh, called very good Co or there's a, a resource called very good copy.com. Um, Eddie Schindler, I think his name is, I'm probably butchering his name. He also just wrote a book and it's just about all things on writing, which is awesome. Uh, build a story brand by Don Miller. I'm a big fan of Don Miller and story brand. Yeah. Uh, use a lot of his techniques, a lot of his tactics, a lot of his principles of clear and concise copy, keeping things simple. Um, and I have a organization that I, I kind of do some solopreneurship with to help people with that. Nice. That's a great, that's a great, uh, and then, uh, breakthrough advertising is a good book. I've heard you mention it before. Yeah. Yep. So that, that book, um, it's going to be expensive, but it's a classic and it's it's tried and true. And it's going to show you some things that are kind of innate, uh, to human behavior and how people make decisions. So psychology of marketing, you're trying to convince people. It's persuasive. You need to be able to convince people to do something. You know, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And so if you can't do that, it doesn't matter how good your product or service is if nobody knows. You know, um, if you're a growing founder, I love the Traction Library, man. Um, so EOS is something that I love, uh, Entrepreneur Operating System. So the book Traction is a really good book if you're growing. If you're an organization that's growing, I would highly encourage everybody uh, to read that book because in all honesty, uh, when it comes down to it, whenever we start a business, the hard part, uh, becomes like the, the simple stuff that doesn't come as simple to founders. Sometimes that's like yeah. your operating system, you know? 
Yeah. Um, so that that gives you an operating system, and it's it's a pretty good one. Yeah. Not and not all founders, not all CEOs are good yeah. operators, right? That's right. It's like that's right. And it's if you find out that that's the case, you either have to get yeah. you have to get educated, or you got to hire somebody that is. Yeah. Um, man, those are all great resources. Yeah, I got I got one more. So yeah. um, if you're if you're just getting started on your entrepreneurial journey, or you're you're writing a business plan and you're getting lost in the complexities, I'm a big fan of business model generation. Oh my so god, it's all I'm... the stuff from Alex Osweiler and Strategizer. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, I have the same book. As a matter of fact, that's the book where I first and it, they had an old one that you could get at Barnes and Noble that was cut like a Calvin and Hobbes book. Yeah. So like it looked like it was part of some big anthology. It doesn't fit on the bookshelf well. Yep. Had huge pictures of some of the different charts and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that book. Yeah. I've never heard anybody yeah, else man. mention that and book. Then, and then the last thing I'll say is this is a digital app. It's called Far Out. And it has every single map in the United States where there's a trail. So don't forget to unplug and I say that by using an app. But if you ever find yourself on the Appalachian Trail yeah. and need to know where the next water source is, yeah, yeah. that app will tell you. All so, right, nice. Um, nice. So don't forget to unplug, go camping, go hike, go do something. Great, uh, great resources, all that you just mentioned. If you, uh, if you could go back in time, um, or you know, or let's just say not back in time, or you could give one good piece of advice to anybody that's getting ready. Uh, to start their own business, mm -hmm. um, you know what? What's that piece of advice? Yeah, man, it's it's to give yourself and your team some grace. Yeah, um, and it and I have a really strong reason why I say that. Whenever you are a founder and you're working with a team that is always like trying to get to that next cusp, to that next apex, and break through to that next that next goal, you tend to like only focus on what you're not doing well. Yeah. You know, and um, you tend to forget what you're doing really well. Yeah. And and I know as a founder or not just as a founder, but as someone that is in that has been in the C-suite, you know, working with a high performing team, you know, we before you know it, you're like, man, we, we really didn't do that bad, you know, Yeah. because um, there's some cultural things that I wish that I could have seen that were happening like hey we need to probably give ourselves a little bit more grace and rest in these victories yeah um because we're really not doing that bad i'm, I'm terrible about that myself you know I, I i need to give out more pats on the back i need to recognize when people are doing a great job and and, and celebrate it you know yeah. and i think that's super important all right well let, let's let's close this podcast out with one last thing we talked about this we talked about this off script yeah man. um you've had some time to think about it so uh, i hope I sincerely hope you don't come at me with some bullshit right now. <laughs> uh, but I want to know what what are what are your top three albums that you oh, can listen on, to man. that you can listen to start to finish, start to finish. It cannot it cannot be it cannot be a soundtrack. It cannot be best of. I'm gonna help you out. I'm gonna give you an extra minute or two to think about it, and I'm gonna name my top three. These are not any particular order, um, but I, I do believe all these at some point in time in my life have either maintained first, second, or third. I want to start with the Weezer Blue album. Um, I that album got me through some particularly hard times. I got shut down. I got shut down by this this girl in high school. Her name was Devin Nunley. I had a big cry. Sorry to dox you on the podcast. We might have to beep her name out. But um, <laughs> God dang, I listened to a Weezer Blue album just having a big cry. I don't even think any of those songs had to do anything had anything to do with lost love. But there I was driving around in my mom's Mazda Protege listening to the Weezer Blue album, having a big goddamn cry. Um, also on there is Fuji's The Score, fantastic, seminal album for hip-hop and R&B. Damn, that album is so good. Um, fantastic, Fuji's The Score is fantastic. And then, of course, Sublime's, I think it's their self-titled album. It's the one that's got Bad Fish and, and uh, 40 Ounces to Freedom and, of course, you know, Century and all these great songs. All fantastic. I could listen to all three of those albums start to finish. I, and I also believe, I think those also were amongst the first five compact discs that i ever purchased and i also owned the sublime and fuji's album on cassette deck as well nice um because we were at a time when technology was reaching an economy of scale so quick that in the span of years i had to buy both cassettes and compact discs jesus yep i'm, I'm 42 okay so you said no greatest hits no greatest hits no soundtracks well that that that's very difficult yeah You're all right so listen i'm, I'm sorry gonna to go put, i'm know. gonna go metallica symphony and metallica damn that's good damn that's, that's good that's that's probably my first okay 
since I can't do greatest hits, I can't. You yeah, can't. I can't do greatest hits. No. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go with Lincoln Park Hybrid Theory. Pretty good. And I'm gonna go with Green Day American Idiot. Damn. Good picks. But I'm not even sure if that's my picks. But you know the the, the three that came at the top, so I'm gonna roll with them because those are what came to mind. Life has seasons, Reggie. That's right. Life has and seasons. In this season, I'll say it's those. Next next year, we can revisit this same question. Yeah, let's do it. And I'll 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 I'll, I'll wrap my rounds or my my arms around whatever your answer may be. I will say that I would have preferred to say the Eagles' greatest hits. Yeah. But you know, you're breaking the rules by having slipped that in there. You know damn well we said no greatest <laughs> gotta, hits. Gotta edit, gotta edit that out. Yeah, <laughs> Reggie, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, to talk with us today. I understand you work here, so it's somewhat obligatory. Um, but uh, truly, I, I appreciate you sharing these personal things. Appreciate you taking the opportunity to dive deep with me. I want to remind everybody that's listening or, or viewing, once again, if you have any interest in reaching out to myself or Reggie directly, you want to learn more about the programs that we offer for veteran entrepreneurs to for include sure. their spouses and family, uh, family members, qualified family members, um, please reach out to warriorrising.org or programming at warriorrising.com. Um, um, I can't thank everybody enough uh, for tuning in. And uh, Re Reggie, I'll let you talk us off. Yeah, man. Warriorrising.org. Don't you forget it. Warriorrising.org. No, it's been real. It's been fun. It ain't been real fun. I appreciate y'all. Thanks, guys. Ciao.